My name is Matt Egan. I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This is the first presentation from our evaluation workshop series. It's for people who are maybe thinking of doing an evaluation of their own, looking to see the impacts of some sort of uh, policy or initiative they're involved in, maybe. Evaluations are expensive. Uh, they take up a lot of time and resource, or they can do. So it's good to know the reasons why you would want to do an evaluation, to make sure it's worthwhile. We're going to discuss that now and we're going to discuss some of the uh, terminology and some of the different types of evaluation. This presentation was developed by myself and colleagues at Spiro at the London School and we're part of the NIHR School for Public Health Research. So with this slide we try to answer the question posed by the presentation title, Why Evaluate? And there's lots of different reasons, different interconnected reasons. The simplest, most basic reason for wanting to evaluate anything is if you've got a, an initiative, a policy, a programme which has a specific objective and you want to know whether that objective has been achieved. That's what the evaluation is going to be about. Often the objectives are around changes that happen to people. You want your intervention to do something to affect people, presumably to benefit them, and if it's a health intervention to benefit their health. So a lot of evaluations are about cha measuring changes in outcomes. Evaluations aren't just about measuring success. Often you'll find that the evaluation finds that there's been no success, sometimes in effectiveness, sometimes even possibly harms. We need to learn from them as well. And finally, you might find that uh, uh, you're having to do an evaluation. It's kind of a funding requirement or it's been requested by your superiors. So evaluation can sometimes be a tick box activity. Well, that's fine. If that's what you have to do, then tick that box. But please try and make your evaluation that you have to do as useful as possible while you're doing it. Evaluation, like any other specialty, comes with its own jargon. And sometimes the jargon can be used imprecisely or have contested meanings. For example, the word intervention is often used to describe the thing being evaluated. Sometimes the intervention is very clearly defined. It may be a new medicine or an eight-week course to encourage healthy eating. But other types of intervention are more complex. For example, a large urban regeneration program might involve a range of different activities affecting homes, neighbourhoods and the economy. It may vary by area and over time and might not have clearly defined start and end dates. Now you generally detect change by taking measures before the intervention starts, that's the baseline, and then following up with more measures at a later date, say when an intervention stops, and maybe further measures later if you're looking at longer term impacts. But obviously if your intervention has no clear start or end date, it can be problematic deciding when to take your measures. Lots of things can affect health besides your particular intervention, for example, a change in the season, an economic recession, an alternative intervention occurring at the same time as yours. We call these other possible causes of change confounders. Evaluators put a lot of time and effort into trying to identify and rule out confounding factors. But we might also want to know if our intervention actually works better or worse because it occurs alongside other activities and they have a kind of synergy together. So, for example, it might be useful to know if a public indoor smoking ban works better when it's just followed a large anti-smoking media campaign. Now the word effectiveness. The word effectiveness is often used when talking about evaluations, but it's sometimes preferable to see the intervention as having a range of possible impacts rather than just having a particular effect that the intervention is trying to change. And finally, control groups. In a classic experiment, you compare your group receiving the intervention to a similar group who are not receiving it. And that helps us rule out confounding if the only thing different about these groups is exposure to the intervention. But controls can be difficult to establish, for example, if the intervention is being rolled out nationally. There are many types of evaluation. Here on this slide, we've categorised them into three types. The first is formative evaluation. What's formative evaluation? Well, it's evaluation that's intended to help that particular intervention. So the idea is you produce interim findings while the intervention is still being rolled out and the people who are delivering the intervention have a look at see how things are going and they may change the way they're delivering it as a result. Formative evaluation deliberately tries to produce an observer effect. It tries to change the intervention it's evaluating as it's being delivered. 
An evaluation might choose to focus on processes. The actual delivery, formative evaluation, often does focus on processes. This is about evaluating how deliverers uh, roll out the intervention, the choices they make. It may also consider how people are receiving the intervention. Do some people have better access to it than others? Are there barriers and facilitators to what makes the intervention roll out smoothly? The final type of evaluation we have here is outcome or impact evaluations. So this is where we try and work out what kind of changes happen to people, usually people, for public health as a result of the intervention. Now, unlike formative evaluation, outcome evaluations often try to avoid the observer effect. So they avoid re uh, reporting findings too early. Well, this is usually fairly easily done because you want to measure your impacts after the intervention is complete if you have a clear completion date. Once you've thought about the purpose of your evaluation, you can then think about what methods are appropriate. As we said, the classic experiment has a before and after, that is a baseline and follow-up format. And it compares a group receiving the intervention with one that is not receiving it. You want your control and intervention groups to be very similar, and the best way of doing this is actually to flip a coin or use some other form of randomization to randomly allocate who gets the intervention and who does not. Who's going to be in your intervention group and who's going to be in your control group. Providing your samples are big enough, this random allocation should help you end up with two similar groups. And we call this kind of uh, study design a randomised control trial. Sometimes it's not feasible to randomly allocate to individuals, but you might be able to randomly allocate to groups or clusters of individuals. And this is uh, called a cluster randomised control trial. An example might be a whole school intervention where instead of randomising the intervention to individual pupils, you randomise schools. Some schools randomly get the intervention and some schools go into the control. There's probably going to be many occasions where you can't randomly allocate at all, typically because you, the evaluator, are not responsible for delivering the intervention. You can't control who gets it and when. When this happens, the evaluator's role becomes less like someone setting up an, an experiment, more like someone observing what's happening, observing what other people are doing and what the outcome of what they're doing is. There's also a rule of thumb that you use quantitative methods, like statistics, to detect change in outcomes over time. So outcome evaluations often have a very strong focus on quantitative measures. Qualitative measures are often used to get better, more detailed information about how an intervention is being delivered, how its impacts are being achieved, what some of the unintended consequences of the intervention might be. It allows you to more fully explore how people experience and think about the intervention. Qualitative research can include things like in-depth interviews, focus groups, ethnography. It can also include documentary analysis of various kinds. Okay, so hopefully you're getting the idea now that choosing the methods for your evaluation isn't simply about deciding what methods are per se the best. It's about thinking about what methods are most appropriate for the kind of questions and the kind of evaluation that you're doing. And this isn't new. In fact, what you're seeing on the slide is a diagram produced by Muir Gray, well, about 20 years ago. And it's a great diagram. I like this. It, it, it gives you a really neat guide to the kind of questions an evaluation might ask and the different study methods you might use appropriately to answer those various questions. Muir Gray was interested in child and family services, which is why there's a sort of child and family service theme to the slide. But you can see how it could be applicable to a whole range of subject areas. You'll also see that RCTs, randomised controlled trials, are indeed uh, shown on, on the slide to be uh, a very good way of measuring a certain type of evaluation question around effectiveness. But you'll also see that there's plenty of other study designs that are better for other types of research question. So hopefully we're getting across the idea that the methods you choose should be appropriate to the research question. And that's the way it should go. Come up with a research question first, then decide what methods are right for it. Don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't let the methods you want to use guide what you're going to do your evaluation on. Again, I'm not the first person to say this. On the slide now you can see a quote which says similar things more eloquently than me. 
Public health's research focus has often been on what can be measured easily, rather than on the immensely more complex issues of the broader social forces that affect health, directly or indirectly. We don't want our evidence base to only measure what can be measured easily, because some of our questions, some of our big issues, are actually very difficult to answer, but we should still try to answer them. This slide, in some way, hopefully, illustrates that point. What you can see there, let's, let's start from the bottom and work our way up. So there's different levels, let's say, that an evaluation could focus on. It could focus on interventions that affect individuals. Individual behavioural change of one kind or another is a typical example. Maybe it affects groups of people, let's say the household or the family. Other kinds of interventions go upstream and try and affect entire communities of people. And others are applied at an even larger scale. Urban regeneration, again, is a great example of this, and it can uh, affect not only one community, but a whole city or several cities worth of communities. As you can imagine, the further you get up that slide, the further, the higher the level you get, the more complex the intervention is likely to become, and the more difficult the evaluations like to become. And so it's not surprising that if you actually look at the literature, if you actually look at the evidence base, you find that there's often lots of evaluations, lots of evidence around individual level interventions, but the higher you get, the closer you get to those community and city-wide uh, or area-wide interventions, the evidence base gets thinner and thinner. Is that a problem? Well, it is, because those large-scale city-wide interventions or area-wide interventions are often expensive, they often affect lots of people, they're often likely to, be, to have lots of uh, unpredictable impacts because they're so complex. And we know very little about their effectiveness or their impacts, or how to deliver them better. So we shouldn't let the difficulty, the complexity of an evaluation question stop us from researching it. In fact, there's an imperative to research those questions. OK, this presentation was originally developed to be given live in front of real people as part of evaluation workshops. And it still can be used by you for that purpose, if you like. Uh, what we tended to do at this point, having given people a brief introduction to what evaluations are and why you might want to do them, is get the audience, usually made out of local practitioners and local people involved in evaluation, to start thinking about how they use evidence in their decision making to give them an idea of what kind of uh, evaluation findings and evaluation evidence might be useful to them. So we asked them to work together around tables and think about the questions, what does evidence mean? What sort of evidence is of most value to them in their decision making? And what sort of evaluations are done and used in their practice?